Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash 1PVS2P. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash 1PVS2P. Thanks to Audible for supporting our podcast, and thanks to you for supporting us. Nintendo announces its new hybrid console, the Nintendo Switch. Video game voice actors organize a strike against the industry. And Rockstar reveals Red Dead Redemption 2. Plus, we've got this week's new game releases and more. It's Tuesday, October 25th, 2016, and you're listening to the 1P vs. 2P podcast. As always, I'm Taylor Ray. I'm Ryan Ray. Let's begin with First Attack. some very exciting news from Nintendo. The Nintendo Switch, which was previously codenamed the NX, it's going to be released in March of 2017. We've known about that release window for a while now, but we finally have gotten some idea about what this console is because Nintendo packed a ton of information without even saying a word in a three-minute reveal trailer that was put up on YouTube. So we're going to talk about everything we learned about this console. It's very interesting and pretty, pretty innovative. Uh, so let's let's talk about the most important thing about this, which is something that fans, I think, predicted a long time ago, which was that it is, in fact, a hybrid home and handheld console. So what does that mean, Ryan? Yeah, so basically, this is kind of the evolution of uh, Nintendo's gimmicks with the Wii U. You know, if you're not familiar with the Wii U, it had kind of like a second screen tablet controller. And uh, this is them iterating on that. Basically, uh, with the Switch, you're going to be able to have a controller with a tablet on it in which you can kind of take it with you on the go, play games portably, play console level uh, games portably. And then uh, when you're at home, if you're not interested in playing portably, you can actually dock the controller tablet into like a docking station and that station will connect to your TV and you can play, uh, have basically a home console. And uh, this is kind of the hybrid thing that has long been rumored. And um, the trailer actually did a good job of showing how that would actually work in practice. Uh, seems to be uh, pretty seamless. Uh, you know, we'll see when the actual product of it comes out. So the trailer showed this guy playing the new Legend of Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, on his home console. And then he decided that he needed to walk his dog. So he actually took the controller out of the docking station. And while he was on the walk with the dog, he he was playing the game, <laughs> which I felt kind of bad for the dog a little bit. But uh, they kept showing these like use case. The, basically, the trailer was this kind of use case scenario for any uh, situation in which you might find yourself taking the switch at to a party, maybe walking the dog. Uh, they showed kind of local multiplayer sessions in which uh, two pe- two people can actually play on one device. But there's also going to be a local multiplayer function where if you connect two switches uh, wirelessly, you can have a four player match going. They didn't really necessarily explain what games might go with that kind of functionality, but the games will come. And yeah, it was it was a very interesting, revealing three minute trailer for a pretty relatively new concept for them. And let's describe how it looks. It sort of looks like the Wii U gamepad, but kind of like a slimmer, sleeker version of it. We don't know the official specs yet. Nintendo uh, has said that they're not saying anything official. Uh, They're not ready to talk about the technical specs. But if I could estimate what I saw In the trailer, it looks like a 7 to 10 inch size tablet measured diagonally across the screen, of course. And when we're talking about in handheld mode, there are these two side controllers that are modular. They're detachable and they're Nintendo's calling this whole system Joy-Con for short for joystick controllers. And on the left side, you have an analog stick at the top and four face buttons. And on the right hand, you do have the same thing, face buttons towards the top, but the joystick on the bottom. And when in handheld mode, right, these two controllers attach and slide into the sides of this 7 to 10 inch screen. While docked, you can leave those controllers on there and bust out a new Switch Pro Controller, which looks almost identical to the Wii U Pro Controller. So if you're more into that traditional controller set, you want to play with the Pro Controller. 
Now, what's also interesting about these modular Joy-Con controllers, the left and the right hand side, is that they can be used separately. So if you detach them, you can use one in each hand, sort of like the Wiimote and Nunchuck configuration from the Wii originally. And also, the Switch is going to come with this uh, Joy-Con grip. So it's the center little plastic piece with two grips, two grips for your hands, for your palms. Uh, and so that gives you sort of a smaller version, a compact version of what the Wii U Pro, Pro Controller does, or excuse me, the Switch Pro Controller does. So if you're more into that, that traditional hand feel, you're going to want to use the Joy-Con grip or the Switch Pro Controller. Right, yeah, there's going to be a few different con controller configurations for this thing. Uh, we'll see in practice if uh, those things are actually attached, how uh, breakable they are, uh, if you can buy replacement ones, or you'll have to buy a whole new controller unit, or you'll have to just redo the console, or you send it into Nintendo for repairs. Um, I think this is a very interesting design. Uh, again, it's an evolution of what they're doing uh, with with the Wii, the original Wii and the Wii U, and, uh, you know, if we're not describing this well, uh, we're going to link the three minute trailer in the show notes for you to ch take a look at. It's a really neat concept. Uh, like you said, the uh, controller sticks are kind of uh, they're not symmetrical. They're on the left side. The one is at the top left and the one on the right Joy-Con is on the lower right. Kind of similar to the um, Xbox 360's uh, controller configuration. And uh, I, I think at this point, analog controllers, uh, dual stick analog controllers are pretty standardized and you can't differ too much from from that kind of form factor. But yeah, they showed a, a couple of games running on this thing. Uh, as we mentioned before, they, meant, um, they showed the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild game. There's going to be a Switch version of that running. Uh, there's an unannounced Mario game that they showed so a brief glimmer of footage for. Uh, there was also some footage of uh, the uh, an NBA game, prob possibly NBA 2K17. Uh, they showed a game that looked very familiar. It looked like Skyrim. Uh, they showed Splatoon. We're not sure if this is a port of the Wii U version of Splatoon or a new Splatoon game. And they also showed Mario Kart. And uh, I have a little note here to myself that it kind of looks like uh, Mario Kart Double Dash because they, it, it looks very similar to Mario Kart 8's uh, art style, but it also had some new features. Uh, you, Big Boo is, was not playable in Mario Kart 8 and uh, it was shown on the Switch. So maybe there's probably a new Mario Kart coming for the Switch. But yeah, some exciting titles. They did not officially announce a... A real lineup for this thing, nor did they say uh, when those games were actually coming. Uh, I'm sure that information will be coming before the uh, release of this thing in March. Yeah, there's rumors of a new Pokemon game because, of course, why wouldn't Nintendo develop a Pokemon game for this thing? Um, but they did reveal that Nintendo is working with 48 total publishers and developers. Among the, the biggest ones include EA, Activision, Capcom. There's a whole huge list here. I also want to mention in the show notes, there's a link to the blog post that we did about everything we know and don't know yet about the Nintendo Switch. So it's sort of a great roundup uh, to familiarize yourself if you haven't heard, haven't seen what the Nintendo Switch really is uh, based on all these announcements. And let's talk about the shape of the games themselves. They're officially called game cards, very similar, it looks like, to the uh, 3DS game card. And actually, it's hard to tell because it appeared in like half a second, but it, it it looks even slimmer and longer, so maybe shaped more like a PlayStation Vita cart. But they slot into the top of the the tablet, the screen of the Switch. Um, but it's not really clear yet if it's backwards compatible with DS and 3DS games. And that's a huge question mark here, is whether or not the Switch will support... Uh, past games will it have virtual console compatibility will it have you know ds 3ds cartridge support we don't know that information yet it doesn't seem like it will accept any disc-based games uh, looking at the dock itself it seems like just an hdmi pass-through so it scales up whatever you saw whatever is running on the tablet uh, is displaying to whatever size hd tv you have Nintendo has yet to say any information about whether or not even downloadable titles will be available on this thing. Yeah, there's also kind of an open question for me about the Switch's battery life. Uh, when we're talking about that kind of uh, size of tablet, uh, you know, that's that's it's not the most powerful processor. There have been some kind of technical questions. It seems to be that this is running on an NVIDIA chipset, their latest uh, mobile chipset. And uh, that's that can be a pretty draining on battery life. So 
Um, right now, the kind of rumor mill that's uh, speculation is that the battery life on this Switch is going to be about three hours in portable mode, but Nintendo hasn't confirmed yet. They uh, All they've said that uh, is they're, they're quoted as saying that it was designed so that players could play as comfortable as possible, even in a place where you have no power supply. Uh, I have my fingers crossed that if there's at least a very short battery life, it will be able to be charged through uh, USB rather than the proprietary uh, charging things that a lot of these t- kinds of consoles typically buy, and then somebody builds a USB converter thing, and then it's just a whole needless exercise. Um, Taylor, I, I, we've talked about the specs. Are you interested in the Switch on day one? I'm very interested, and I think it all depends on what price point it comes out at. If it's somewhere around $200, $250, I think it will sell extremely well. And And they spent most of the trailer showing off a lot of the Uh, multiplayer configurations i really like the concept of sharing a screen on the go say for instance you know that they showed people in the backseat of a car playing two individual joy cons so one player is playing with the left controller the second player is playing with the right controller when you flip it horizontally it's just like a typical almost like an nes shape right instead of the d-pad though you have the joystick instead and i thought that was a pretty neat concept now whether or not the screen will be large enough and you have to squeeze next to your friend or whatever that's remain that remains to be seen, but I think that's kind of a, a neat novel concept. You know, this tablet that has the kickstand itself, I think is really cool. They showed a guy on an airplane. I could totally see myself doing that as well, uh, sitting there, having it uh, propped up uh, on the tray table in front of him. I, I like that idea. The flexibility to attach the controllers and actually hold the screen itself, much like the Wii U gamepad, I think is really, really, really cool. However, I've, if it's priced at $300 or more, like a lot of analysts are uh, guessing at this point, I think people are going to start to question whether or not it's worth it versus something like a dedicated, more powerful home console like the PS4, the Xbox One, because the base models of both of those, the uh, PS4 Slim and the uh, Xbox One S, both of those are priced at $300 right now. So there's a much bigger library of games. We know everything about those so far, right? We know about their backwards compatibility. We know about the network. Nintendo, there are all these huge question marks. So a lot has yet to be announced, but I'm very excited about this. I think it's a pretty, pretty neat concept. As far as, I don't know, the games library, the few that they showed off, it seems like they're going along with everyone else. They're re-releasing some of the older games. They even, as a surprise, showed off a third-party title, Skyrim, knowing that Nintendo is partnering with Bethesda to re-release Skyrim on this thing. You, you know, it always comes down to the games for me. What are the games available immediately after launch? Yeah, I think you uh, hit it, the nail right on the head with the, you know, it. we need to see what games come out of this thing. Uh, I think right now it's kind of in this uh, proto Wii U stage where we're kind of excited about the gimmick that Nintendo's including in the box this time. But we have yet to see like uh, a real proof of concept that really sells us on uh, why this gimmick needs to be this way. I, I, I think for me, this is a perfect proof of concept. I really like the gimmick this time. I I think this is the perfect commuter console. Right now, I am a, co- a person who commutes on a train, on a bus. Uh, this, this console would be perfect for me. Right now, I'm commuting with my 3DS and Wii U, and uh, the promise of those systems was that they would deliver console-level games, and uh, that promise wasn't totally fulfilled. I'd say more so with the uh, 3DS that they were closer to that vision than they were with the Vita. But you know, Nintendo has this really interesting history when their uh, back is up against the wall. They're they're in very experimental mode right now. Uh, you'll notice that in the three minute trailer, they didn't show any kids in this trailer. Uh, so I'm kind of left wondering who this is, the audience for this is. Uh, I don't think the audience is uh, aspirational millennials going to p- rooftop parties, bringing their Nintendo Switch like. If you're going to those kinds of parties, you're more likely more interested in the party itself than bringing your Nintendo console, you nerd. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, you know, I think I am there day one for the Zelda game. The Zelda game looks like it's kind of changing the face of what Zelda actually is. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously on board for any Mario game that's released for this thing. And I think the comparison to the... Uh, their competitors, the Xbox One and the PS4, 
is uh, is not really fair because Nintendo has never been about um, competing with the other consoles in terms of power. Uh, you the reason you buy a Nintendo console is to buy Nintendo games, and it turns out that people actually really really care deeply about Nintendo's gaming franchises. Like <clears throat> you could probably name about ten characters in Nintendo's Pantheon. In fact, they're probably the first top ten characters in Super Smash Brothers. Uh, compared to like naming three on uh, Microsoft and Sony's collective platforms, right? Like the, people don't have attachments to those consoles other than the fact that like if you don't have a PC, that's what you're going for. You're going for those consoles uh, explicitly. So uh, I think Nintendo has a little bit of a different audience. And uh, I'm just curious to see how they're going to convince parents to to buy this for their kids because Nintendo is typically the family-friendly friendly, uh game company and uh, i could see kids really breaking these controllers pretty quickly and so hopefully the uh console isn't too expensive or too too technically complicated because um yeah nintendo could have a real problem on their hands but uh like like you said i am super excited for this this is kind of like the pitch perfect thing they could do right now they're trying to to grasp the the middle road here and uh, this could potentially be nintendo's last home console effort um they haven't said Officially, that's the case, but we're all kind of speculating that. But their partnership with DNA, uh, they're they're currently working on building uh, like a Nintendo level account system, like Xbox Live, like PSN. And uh, if that's the case, the Switch could be uh, the last home console, and then we just get revisions on it uh, moving forward. I, I could see that, and I could also see Nintendo turning into more of a, a third party developer and publisher and selling off its character licenses, its IPs. You already see them doing that so far with Super Mario Run. They're developing that in-house with DNA, but that's coming out on iOS and Android, so very exciting. So they're they're getting into releasing Nintendo games with Nintendo characters on non-Nintendo platforms. So very interesting. Yeah, very exciting times. Um, they've said that they are going to announce the price point, technical specs, more details, the launch games lineup. They're going to be announcing all of that before the March 2017 launch window. Moving on to our next story, a very important one if you like voice acting in your video games, because a lot of very prominent voice actors are striking against the video game companies that hire them for very specific reasons. We'll cover those. So effective as of last Friday, the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation, of television and radio artists, otherwise known as the SAG, and there's the division of the uh, AFTRA. Uh, they declared a strike against 11 specific video game publishers over games that went into production after February 17th of 2015. So some of those companies include EA, Insomniac, Activision, Warner Brothers, Take-Two, and Disney. Ryan, what are their demands? What's going on here in this conflict? Uh, so the voice actors are basically striking because they're they're listing issues such as extensive and lengthy vocal sessions, as well as a lack of uh, safety on the part of when they have to do mocap for stunts. Um, there's also a problem with the payment system. They're citing a lack of backend payment for jobs such as residual payments. Um, I should also note here that most game developers... Uh, the actual developers themselves, the companies, um, make a, a certain amount of money, a certain amount of revenue when they sell a game. And th that doesn't get kicked back to the individual developers based on how well the game does. And uh, for the voice actors, that's even less the case. They only get paid a flat fee. And they're saying, hey, wait a minute. Uh, let's say uh, they're a voice actor on the game like Skyrim. Uh, you know, Skyrim d did really well. Uh, we need, we want like a percentage of the, the total sales. And right now, voice actors are kind of getting a bad deal on that front. This is not the first time the voice actors have threatened to strike, but this is the first time they're actually taking it to the full term. And uh, there's been a kind of a lot of back and forth uh, since the announcement of this strike. It seems like the two sides aren't, uh, their negotiation, let's say, isn't going very well. And uh, I'm going to read you this uh, quote that uh, came when Kotaku asked SAG-AFTRA for a statement on this. And they uh, SAG-AFTRA said, quote, We are surprised to hear that the video game companies with whom we have been negotiating for nearly two years now assert that progress is being made on the major concerns we are focused on in this negotiation. We look forward to hearing their thoughts on the crucial issues of performer safety and fair compensation that we have put forward. So, yeah, uh, expect this fight to drag out. Uh, expect <laughs> that a lot of the 
uh, games that you expect for there to be voiceover work for, either to have uh, lesser talent going forward or to be completely silent. All we get is dialogue boxes. Um, you know, this doesn't look like it's going to be settled anytime soon. And um, I, I don't I don't know. This is kind of a weird one for me because I think there should be some fairer labor practices in place. And I think they totally are within their right to strike. But at the end of the day, I don't think your average everyday gamer really <laughs> cares about voice acting in video games. Like, I I think there are a few characters that have like very memorable uh, voice actors that like are inseparable or seemingly inseparable, right? Like, so, we, previously, like Solid Snake would have been one of those, and then Konami yeah, David like Hader for sure, D- David Hader, and then they detached it and made Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, do it for Metal Gear Solid Five, um, but some of the the people involved are like pretty prominent voice actors, Nolan North, uh, Jennifer Hale, uh, people who time and time again play do a lot of voice acting in these video games. But I don't think your everyday gamer is going to give a crap about this. Like, <laughs> uh, it's most people probably would actually say that video games were probably better before they started talking to to you. Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, gamers are going to care when their games are starting to get. Uh, delayed for sure. I'm sure that's what's going to happen here if this does not get resolved pretty quickly because the union seems uh, dead set on improving sort of the the safety problems, which I could totally see as a legitimate concern. Uh, Oftentimes, I've heard from Wes Johnson, who's uh, been a voice actor in a lot of Bethesda games and Fallout series in the Skyrim, uh, in Oblivion as well. And he went through like sort of this uh, voice acting workshop. I sat in And he's giving us commands like, okay, I want you to pretend like you just got stabbed in the stomach. Okay, I want you to pretend like you just swung your sword at a a giant ogre. And you have to make all these guttural noises with your throat. That can cause damage over time. And for someone who makes their living using their voice, using their throat, you know, you have to protect that in the same way that a lot of uh, workers, like construction workers who are part of unions, uh, need to uh, be aware and be safe and take care of their own bodies. So I totally get that piece. The part about all the residuals is a sort of a weird situation because not all actors are created equal. You know, there, there are some folks who are just starting off in the industry who I'm sure would be very satisfied with the flat fee. I'll be for acting in general. You know, it's very hard to get uh, steady work. They're often just freelancers. But I'm very sure that they could replace them with lesser known people and gamers wouldn't really know the difference. They just unless it's unbelievably bad, like it really distracts from the gameplay. Yeah, I just don't know if they have a ton of leverage here. So uh, we'll we'll definitely keep following this story as it develops. Uh, I understand that they're starting to picket some offices in California uh, this week, starting with the uh, EA studio in L.A. We'll keep in touch. It's also cool that uh, bigger outlets have taken notice, too. I saw the story first on NPR, which I thought was interesting. The other thing is that one of their major other complaints is that the industry is like super secret. A lot of these voice actors read these lines, read dialogue, talk about the story, and they don't even know for what game it's going to come out with. Like they they might sign an NDA, but they don't even know the title of the game. According to some preliminary uh, discussions that they've had, uh, the game companies have agreed to reveal if an actor's role is recurring or does involve, you know, the dialogue using racial slurs or sexual content, but they have not agreed yet to disclose the titles for the games that the voice actors are working for, which I think would be super important if, let's say, they want to build a resume or a portfolio or say, like, oh, hey, I uh, worked a year ago on, uh, I did some voices for this character. I have no idea which video game he appears in, but I sure did do that work, like, Come on, that's that's like that's absurd. <laughs> that's absurd. Like I would be I would be offended if like I worked so hard on this thing I got paid and then uh, like when when it actually came out I didn't get the proper credit. Like again, the video game industry is super secretive and uh, we've known about some games actually because of voice actor leaks before. So, I totally get the other side of it too, but we will f- follow f- this story for sure, but again, I think I think Joe Walmart doesn't doesn't care about this story at all. Yeah, and hopefully Joe Walmart listens to this podcast too. Uh, last but not least, some sad news uh, with the industry: United Front Games, the studio sort of best known for developing Sleeping Dogs, has officially shut down. It seems like it came out of the blue, out of the sudden, because they were working on uh, Smash and Grab. This was this sort of online gang warfare game. It literally hit early access, and the day after it was put up, it was taken down. It just had a free weekend on Steam, 
I, it seemed like it was like a huge gamble and they needed those pre-sale numbers and they didn't hit. And for whatever reason, uh, you know, they were not cash solvent. So yeah, kind of sad news. In addition to uh, Sleeping Dogs, United Front developed two racing games for the PS3, Mod Nation Racers, Little Big Planet Karting. They helped out on Tomb Raider, the Definitive Edition, Halo the Master Chief Collection, and Disney Infinity 3.0. We always hate about uh, folks losing their jobs in the industry, so we wish them the best. Sad news, though, that uh, we're not going to see a new Sleeping Dogs, right? That's probably the most disappointing thing for me because I think Sleeping Dogs was a really, really cool open world game set in Hong Kong, a setting that we almost never see. It was very well done for like a, a, mo- a game about basically a kung fu movie. And uh, it was kind of like over the top in the way you might expect Grand Theft Auto games. And uh, the combat was a uh, Batman style combat, but it was very well done. And uh, it was just such like a wacky, cool game that I don't think enough people played. And they were, I know they were working on a game called Triad Wars that they uh, did a beta for, and then it never really went anywhere after that. I hope somebody uh, either re- brings back Unifi- United Front Games or uh, buys the IP f- uh, for Sleeping Dogs because I think it's such a promising, promising premise. And uh, I-, I would really like to see a follow-up to Sleeping Dogs because it's such a cool game. Uh, <laughs> as a side effect of this news, however, Sleeping Dogs is now pro- probably going to be on sale. So uh, you can pick that game up on the cheap. So uh, go get th- go get that if you haven't played it. I highly recommend it. Yeah, same here. Highly recommended. Let's move on to... Uh, last week and this week's new video game releases. I love new releases. Let's cover the ones from last week first. They include Battlefield 1 for PC, PS4, and Xbox One, and the other one was Civilization 6 for PC. Ryan, of these two, which one of these are you most excited for? I think that's a trick question because I'm excited for both of them. However, I've already picked up Battlefield 1, and I think I'm going to pick up Civilization 6 when it's on sale because typically the Civilization games, uh, I don't have the chance to really sit down with them until about six months after they're out. But um, let's talk about Battlefield 1 first because since I've played the, actually played that. So this is a squad-based team multiplayer first-person shooter. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Battlefield franchise, this time it's going back to the setting of World War One. And, uh, you know, typically military first person shooters don't have this setting. Typically it's World War II, the Vietnam War or uh, beyond with the more modern games. <laughs> They've actually included a pretty compelling single player campaign this time. Uh, f- it follows the stories of the different theaters of war in World War One uh, has about five or six characters that you can play through. And uh, I, that so far in my uh, experience playing that it effectively serves as the introduction to some of the mechanics and multiplayer um, the, the first story that you kind of follow is this like tank commander and it shows you how to do the tank controls and how, how best to use that and shows you kind of uh, the levels in the single player campaign kind of build strategies and tactics into your brain so that you can cross them over into the multiplayer. Obviously, the multi- this being a Battlefield game, the multiplayer is the main draw here. Multiplayer has six modes, including, um, of course, the Conquest and Rush uh, standbys modes that Battlefield has always been known for, and the new War Pigeons, uh, which is basically a uh, uh, capture the flag map, instead of but instead of capturing flags, you're capturing pigeons that you then release, because, of course, in World War I, they didn't work. They didn't capture flags. They released pigeons and messenger p- pigeons, and uh, operations, which is kind of an interesting uh, longer form mode uh, that is objective based. It's kind of an attack defend mode, and it goes in rounds. And uh, so, for example, if you're on the attack team, you know it. You'll have to attack. Uh, certain points and if you fail you go on to the next round and uh, the attack team will actually gain an advantage to try to uh, kind of balance out the defense uh, actually winning and it goes and goes and goes it's kind of set up in the kind of like the overwatch uh, style of you know best of however however many rounds and uh, it's it's really really cool i think battlefield has always been the more team-based fun uh active multiplayer game compared to Call of Duty. Uh, Call of Duty is really more about um, your solo performance, how well you do individually. Battlefield is more about how do you work well with within a team. And I think this time they've done a really great job with the uh, authenticity. There's actually a great progression. They seem to have taken the like lessons from Star Wars Battlefront and translated it into Battlefield 1. It's a really compelling product and uh, has server browsers. It has a large player count. The maps are really nice. 
Uh, the guns feel very weighty. The movement feels just right. It feels very precise. And this game just feels very deliberate in a way that like, I really, really appreciate. Battlefield games are always like typically pretty glitchy or laggy or like just a, like a, a cluster of epic proportions. And this time we're getting the size and scope, but not so much of the bugginess. And uh, I, I really, really like it so far. I think one of the mainstays of Battlefield multiplayer maps is that they're incredibly huge and you have to rely heavily on vehicles. So whether that's prop planes in this one in Battlefield 1s or uh, horses or tanks. But I understand there's also like a Zeppelin you can fly. Is that right? Right. Yeah. And it, they've improved upon the like destruct uh, environmental destructibility. So the Zeppelin can actually go down uh, and... Uh, kind of changed the way the battlefield actually is in previous battlefield games in three and four it typically was like one building on the map that could be destroyed and that would change how things went but this time you can actually like destroy buildings and wreck shop and wreck zeppelins and it actually changes the way uh the the map looks and feels and plays um so it's a little bit more substantial here it's just like it's just a, a like a job well done all around yeah i actually already have the game too but i haven't gotten to play it this past weekend because i had other plans but i'm very excited to check it out this week um so likely have my take by next week's episode do you want to touch on civilization 6 a little bit more yeah, so uh, b- briefly, uh, Civilization VI is the latest, greatest in the Civilization series. This is a kind of like a strategy game uh, where you build cities and, and to, in hopes of building your empire up and to achieve one of several different victory states. Um, in Civ VI, they're actually adding a, a few new features. Uh, basically, they've removed uh, city stacking, uh, where you could kind of stack up all your resources on one city node. Um, this time, there you your citywide improvements are divided up into districts. Um, so this gives this the game kind of a more board game like feel, uh, probably uh, similar to Settlers of Catan, more in that mold. Um, they've also added this like Eureka Moments thing, which is they're kind of like objective based quests that give you research bonuses based on completing certain tasks. So, for example, if you go after uh, three barbarian camps and succeed um, that will make your re- your military research um, go faster they've also actually removed the diplomacy victory condition in favor of a new religion vi- victory condition where uh, now you have to spread your civilization's theology to every other society to win the game that's one of the four the new four uh, victory states and uh, early reviews have been saying that this game is just as addictive as previous Civ games, which is <laughs> a pretty significant problem because if you've played Civilization before, uh, you you start playing at eight o'clock at night, and then uh, just one more turn later, it's all of a sudden five o'clock in the morning, and you're wondering where where the, all the time went. Yep. These games these games are really like time sinks, and that's why I have to kind of wait on them because. Uh, it's just, I, if I start playing them, I'm not going to stop playing them and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to just lose consciousness. It's, it's, it's a really great game. And if this is your first civilization game, like I'm super excited for you. This is, this is like a great PC game. And, uh, yeah, they typically do a very good job with the balance and they really like cool historical societies and empires that you can play as. When this game was officially announced on Twitter, I do remember 2k putting out uh, a tweet uh, with the trailer and it, it used the hashtag one more turn. So they totally get uh, the addictiveness about this game. So I, I totally agree. That's happened to me a couple of times with the uh, revolution series uh, in civilization. And I would also say that this one also the, the art style to civilization six versus five and beyond earth has a more revolution art style to it, more cartoony, bright colors, bright landscapes, um, the, the leaders themselves are more uh, caricatured. So I appreciate that. It's a little more lighthearted, but still adds all that depth and strategy that the Civilization series is known for. So uh, I will definitely check this game out, but you must dedicate a lot of time to this because one game can take several hours. So it's one of those things that you have to sit down and play a session for a while because you're going to be there for a long time. Uh, Last but not least, we have this week's new game releases, and the notable one we found was Titanfall 2 out for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Right, so this is the uh, follow-up to uh, the Xbox One launch game Titanfall. It did appear on other platforms, uh, which, if you remember, was pretty good, but it had kind of a short-lived player base uh, on the multiplayer side. That game was multiplayer only. 
And uh, the the original Titanfall did not have a lot of progression in its multiplayer. You kind of got the guns that you were working with, the Titans that you were working with, and there wasn't much there after that. Uh, Titanfall 2 is looking to improve upon that, and they've also added a single-player campaign in case the uh, multiplayer ba- player base uh, dries up this time. And uh, we don't have any reviews yet because the game is actually coming out this Friday, but Polygon got an early copy of the game, and uh, the review by Arthur Geese uh, says that uh, Titanfall 2 is good, uh, but it's kind of inconsistent. The AI in the single-player mode is pretty bad. Uh, However, the controls both on foot and in the Titan feel fluid, which was actually the thing that really... um, was really great about the first Titanfall to me. It feels so much different than other first person shooters, uh, in this vein, because you could kind of like wall run, uh, kind of like mirror's edge style across buildings, across, uh, multiplayer maps could really flow in and out between, uh, combat encounters. And uh, if the Titans felt really weighty and like really good, they were kind of overpowered in Titanfall one. Right. And that's the kind of the other problem with Titanfall 2. They've uh, they've weakened the Titans a little bit. They have now just have a health bar instead of a health bar and an overshield. Uh, on the other hand, they've also weakened your options if you're on foot to take down the Titans. Um, so they're kind of approaching the balance problem um, the wrong way on both ends. And so it seems like it's harder to take down Titans if you're on foot. Uh, he also, uh, Geese also said that the multiplayer maps feel more restricted and confined compared to Titanfall 1, which, like, uh, that's a problem because, like, if you're just shooting people down hallways, like, that's not what you want in a game where you control these big robot mechs, right? You kind of want these more open spaces to, to fight in, maybe more like Godzilla-style cities that you could c- compete in. I don't know. This is this is a busy release season for multiplayer first person shooter games. Battlefield one came out this past week. Titanfall two is coming out this week. And then not too long from now, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare is uh, coming out. And so Titanfall two is in this weird place where uh, it's competing with those two other games. If it's not good, I'm not sure that people will come come back for Titanfall two. Well, I spoke too soon because we have another video game release, which is World of Final Fantasy out on PS4 and Vita. It's a mashup of a Final Fantasy game with a chibi art, cute art style. It was featured heavily at E3. Uh, it's all about monster collecting in this one. It's an RPG with active time battle mechanics. Uh, you collect monsters from all across the Final Fantasy universe, stack them on top of each other, uh, get them to fight other monster towers. It's got characters from everywhere, uh, just like Dissidia. You know, there's that crossover characters from everything. Um, Theat Rhythm, all those other games that sort of celebrate Final Fantasy these days. This is another one of those. So if you're a huge Final Fantasy uh, fan, you should definitely check this game out and let us know what you think about it. As for the new video game announcements for this week, here comes a new challenger! Some pretty shocking, exciting news. Rockstar announcing the Red Dead Redemption 2 coming next fall in 2017. They teased it very heavily on Twitter uh, throughout all of last week. Got a lot of people speculating. They finally dropped a teaser trailer for it. How excited are you for this, Ryan? I'm super excited. It wasn't that long ago that I wrote an article um, when Red Dead Redemption came to backwards compatibility for Xbox One, are urging people to play Red Dead Redemption. And now I'm vindicated. Uh, they're doing a sequel to this game. I am super excited. Red Dead Redemption, if you're not familiar, is a cowboy open world game uh, kind of set in the like GTA molds where you're um, kind of doing crimes to uh, and serving and doing missions for people um, trying to uh, uncover the story. And uh, it was really, really well done. Uh, had a great soundtrack. Had a, just like a really great feel. Fun to play. Um, just a really great game that I, I recommend you check out. They never did a PC version of it. So uh, if you're looking to play that game, it's available on um, the Xbox 360, PS3. And also now if you own an Xbox One, uh, you can play that through the backwards compatibility. And uh, I actually heard it's also coming to PlayStation Now. So if you have a PS4, you can uh, stream Red De- the original Red Dead Redemption. But yeah, the uh, t- teaser trailer was very short, only about a minute long. The game looks very beautiful from what we've seen. Uh, again, this is they've only announced it for consoles, which I'm very surprised of because the <laughs> Red, a Red Dead Redemption game on the PC is something I think fans of the game are really clamoring for. And Grand Theft Auto did come to the PC eventually, and that, that version of the game was beautiful looking, ran very well, uh, probably contributed to the success of Grand Theft Auto Online. And uh, they're saying for Red Dead Redemption 2, they're going to actually uh, blow out the multiplayer mode uh, to be more like Grand Theft Auto Online because <laughs> Grand Theft Auto Online did 
a, it did very well for Rockstar, and uh, they're probably looking to uh, go back for more success and uh, make a lot more money with Red Dead Redemption 2. Uh, there were a few rumors circulating that this is a prequel game, which for me, that would be slightly disappointing because uh, if you haven't played uh, the original Redemption all the way through, the main character... Uh, doesn't have spoiler a very alert. Spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. Spoiler alert. The main character uh, <laughs> doesn't have a very favorable end. He dies uh, the last two hours of the game. You play actually play as a son. Um, so if this is a prequel game that tells the story of John Marston's youth, I, I'm not sure. I'm definitely interested in playing that again, but I'm not sure that I'm looking exactly for more John Marston. Um, hopefully it doesn't go that way. Hopefully it's a true sequel. Uh, hope maybe it'll tell the story of his son's adventures. His son's name is Jack, um, or possibly a new. Uh, posse of of characters uh in the uh teaser image that they put posted it kind of looks like the magnificent seven uh seven cowboys across a like red and yellow sunset i don't know man i i i am excited and also very scared that about this game uh, i just want to i just want to see it come out next year yeah it's only confirmed for xbox one and ps4 for next fall um, no pc uh version announced yet very strange. You'd think they would. PC seems to do wonders for Rockstar games. Like you said, GTA V make, makes a ton of money with all those microtransactions and brand new modes they've got uh, embedded within GTA Online. Seemed like a, a pretty no-brainer move, I guess, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, let's segue into what we're playing uh, these past two weeks. Ryan, what have you been checking out? So I've been playing Call of Duty uh, the Infinite Warfare Beta. Uh, this is the new Call of Duty game, uh, not the Modern Warfare remaster that's packaged if you pre-order the Legacy Edition. And uh, unfortunately, you just missed the beta. It ends uh, as of today. This is just a, a preview of the multiplayer mode. And I unfortunately have to report that it doesn't seem very good. It seems to be doubling down on the uh, Black Ops 3 kind of uh, MOBA-esque character class system that where basically you pick a certain character and that's dictates more or less your powers and uh, how you play the game. So in this one, you play a, a soldier where you kind of basically choose uh, kind of like a, a suit and the suits have diff- uh, can be uh, the ones that I, I saw in the beta. There was one that was kind of a more all around class. There was one that was more of like a defensive uh, heavy gun class. And then, then there was another one that was built for more close encounters, um, moves quickly and uh, is equipped with a shotgun. And uh, this is uh, going after the like pick 10 system where basically you can kind of uh, customize your your uh, player kit out. You know, you can take two primary guns if you spec a certain way. You can take more perks, so on and so forth. But yeah, it just didn't feel great. This seems to be kind of like arcade paced, a Twitch movement in a Call of Duty game where <laughs> they try to get you to like wall run, but the levels aren't really built for wall running. Uh, I think people who really like Call of Duty are really going to be excited about this, but I think the rest of us, I, it, it, to me, it just seems like they're going the absolute wrong direction. And I actually think that the like packaging of Modern Warfare uh, in this, in this, uh, in the more premium versions of this game is actually probably an apology to old fans of Call of Duty because like I, I just it didn't feel good. Like I, if they had stuck with the like advanced warfare model of like okay. The movement's going to be a little bit faster. You can kind of like double jump and jetpack and grapple hook and do all this stuff like that would have been fine. But then they kind of did it for me, a major misstep with Black Ops 3, where it just didn't feel great. Like it, it felt kind of mushy, swimmy, and the like c- the controls like totally make that mode. And the beta for Infinite Warfare did not sell me on the game at all. And I, I think if Modern Warfare Remastered didn't come with the package for me, I probably wouldn't be buying this game. I'd probably stick to Battlefield 1. Hot take, but I think a lot of people would agree with you. I know that's one of the major reasons why I pre-ordered the game. I did want to play the Modern Warfare Remastered. I wanted to play those old maps all over again. I thought it was a great, great pre-order incentive, and I'm afraid we fell sucker for it. But again, this is the beta. Things can change. That was only the multiplayer. We don't know about the single player yet. I I don't know. I do have to ask you, though, because I was a huge fan of Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, which it's been two games um, since then, right? So Advanced Warfare, it had that boost strafing, like you talked about, with that jetpack. Is that here or no? Uh, Yes, they're 
appears to be that. And also, they've also included, uh, if you remember in Black Ops 3, there was kind of like a superpower that was activated with every character class. So every uh, suit of armor that you put on uh, has a different one, and you can actually uh, change them. They're now customizable. They're not set in stone. Um, So like the assault class that I played, the all-around class, had this... uh, once the meter filled up, I could activate the super, and it gave me a gun that looked kind of like a, a V, as a V-shaped gun. It basically had like a bigger area of effect and was more powerful than the standard assault rifles, and it was uh, available for a limited time. Uh, there were other powers available in the beta, but I didn't really get a te- chance to test them out. So, um, yeah, if you like kill streaks and uh, the Call of Duty way of doing multiplayer shooters, like. I guess this is the game for you, but we'll see when it when it comes out. The game is out in two weeks. You've also played the Pokemon Sun and Moon demo? Yes, that's available if you uh, have a 3DS for free. I uh, highly recommend checking it out if you're interested in the Pokemon franchise. Uh, they've done some really like quality of life improvements, I think. So in, in battle, basically all of your uh, moves now have a little information icon telling you which moves are going to be effective, very effective, uh, sorry, effective, super effective, or not very effective against the opposing Pokemon if you've battled them, if you've used those moves against Pokemon before. So this will kind of expedite things. It won't make you memorize that like type chart that you've had to do in previous Pokemon games, but it might make the game a little bit easier. Um, you know, the Pokemon games aren't really known for their uh, level of difficulty. Uh, they're kind of known for being uh, addicting, kind of very basic RPGs. Um, they've also done some interesting systems around... Um, they're not just going to be uh, gym leader battles. They're also going to be these things called trials, where basically you uh, take on a challenge and uh, it awards you with um, some, some kind of uh, badge or uh, item. <laughs> In the demo, they actually have like a version of Pokemon Snap as the trial, uh, where you have to photograph a, a certain amount of Pokemon, and then when you photograph them, the Pokemon uh, come and, and battle you. I really like the Hawaiian setting for this game. Uh, they've added some new Pokemon. The new Pokemon uh, look really cool. In the in the demo, you play as a Greninja. You can bring that Greninja over into the main game if you play this demo. They're also doing this thing where also probably taking out a little bit of the HMTM stuff. So you know how in the original mainline Pokemon games, um, in order to uh, surf across a body of water, you had to have a Pokemon equipped with the move Surf, right? So now you have riding Pokemon uh, that you can kind of just summon once you gain th- that ability, and they can help you like blow through rocks. You can ride this Tauros in the demo. Um, you're going to be able, you won't have to have basically Pokemon where you put on these crappy HM moves and that you're forced to use. Instead, you'll just have uh, other Pokemon outside of your party that you'll be able to be summoned at command when you need them. Oh, perfect. That was always the worst when you had to take up a slot with a Pokemon that could learn one HM that you had to use to get to, to, to progress the story. That's a huge, huge improvement. Yeah, and the demo did really a great job of selling me on this new Pokemon game. I think now I'm all in. I think also Pokemon Go has definitely reinvigorated fans' interest in uh, this next Pokemon game. Uh, 3DS sales completely spiked after uh, the Pokemon Go came out. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm i probably be getting Pokemon Sun. Uh, of course, they always do this like red-blue thing where some Pokemon will be available in Pokemon Sun and some will be available in Pokemon Moon. So Sun to me looks like the cooler one. I, that's probably the version I will get. Good, because I want the moon one. <laughs> um, I've been playing, speaking of 3DS, I've been playing Picross 3D Round 2, which was a downloadable title. I think I've talked about it on the show before when it was released, but I've been playing it every night before I go to bed. I play about an hour's worth. It's awesome. I love it. I've always loved Picross games. Picross 3D on the original Nintendo DS was very addicting, challenging. I, I just love the improvements that they've done with Round 2. Now, I, had, I was very hesitant at first because this is a $30 downloadable title. And I thought, man, this game better be long. I better get my money's worth. And it's really worth every penny. If you love puzzle games, if you love Picross, this one's for you. I highly, highly recommend it. Essentially, it's different from Picross 3D1 because instead of just solving like a cube's worth of uh, uh, shapes. So the basic concept of Picross 3D is that you start off with a square rectangle size cube and you have to break away blocks based on numbers that dictate which blocks should be broken and which blocks should be kept in a 3D space. And in this game, you have two different colors. So it adds a, a new layer of difficulty here, but it also gives you a new hint system and some shortcuts you can take 
to help you solve puzzles quicker. For instance, you can paint certain blocks with one of the two different colors. You can also, when you start off the puzzle, you can hit like a, a, a bomb button that immediately blows away any blocks or rows that have a zero next to them, meaning there are no blocks in this row that should be left. They should all be broken. So before in Picross 3D, in the first game, you had to individually break these blocks and it was kind of tedious to start off. This time, it just takes like half a second and it's done. I love it. It's very creative, colorful. It's one of these lighthearted puzzle games, but um, can be very challenging. And on top of that, each puzzle has three different difficulty settings and medals you can earn based on how many strikes, like if you made a mistake, how fast you completed it. You know, it, it adds a little bit of replayability there. If you've beaten one puzzle on normal, you can go ahead and go back and try it on hard mode. So I, I love it. I highly, highly recommend it. It's one of these must-own 3DS titles. I have a quick question for you on this. How good are the tutorials? Because this is a this is a game that uh, I'm super interested in because I like puzzle games. But I've uh, Picross and Sudoku like games have always kind of. Uh, like I've taken a, a back seat to because they involve math and I'm not interested in the math portion. How, how good are the tutorials and how easy it, uh, how easy is the difficulty ramp? Like, do you think somebody like me can get interested in this game pretty quickly? Absolutely. But let me first start off with saying that there's no math involved in any of these games. It, it's just the appearance of it because there's all these different digits and numbers that you see on screen, but there's no math. It's all logic based. So the basic premise of, uh, Picross is that, okay, in a 2D space, you have a grid, and uh, on each column and row, you have a, a number assigned. Based on the context clues, you have to look at the numbers on each row and column and figure out which spaces should be filled in. For instance, if you have uh, like a 2x2 two two square and the first column has the number 2 next to it, you know that you need to shade in those two spaces. So that's the basics uh, of Picross. Uh, they're also called nonograms, so I would highly encourage you to download like a free app. There are a bunch of these free nonogram Picross games uh, available on iOS and Android that get you into this game. But if you've never tried those, then yes, I would say the tutorials are very good. Embedded within the game, the first couple puzzles teach you important lessons about the logic behind it, like the best practices, the, the best strategies for you to solve puzzles uh, quickly based on what you've seen, you start noticing patterns. This game teaches you that right from the get-go. So as you progress, you start encountering more advanced strategies, more difficult puzzles, but along the way, it will stop and tell you, okay, complete these next five tutorial puzzles that'll teach you uh, how to solve these harder ones. So I think, yes, it's still very accessible, even if you didn't try the first Picross 3D. You should really, really, really check it out, Ryan. I think you'd love it. Yeah, I probably would. Let's talk about another uh, game that uses your noggin. Uh, you've been playing really bad chess. Explain to me exactly what this is. Yeah, I downloaded it for iPad. Um, and I have to say, I've always been horribly, horribly terrible at chess, real life chess. Um, but this game is pretty interesting. Um, it's free. Uh, it's available on iOS only. I've downloaded it on my iPad. What you do when you first launch the game is set yourself in a placement game. You immediately battle the AI to see if you can hit a checkmate. And um, based on the number of moves, it will figure out you know, whether or not you failed, whether you lost or won the game. It will set you at a certain rank. Based on your rank, the lower you are, the more powerful pieces you have to battle the AI. So for example, like I, I placed very poorly. So <laughs> um, my next game... I had like several queen pieces, which are the most powerful piece on the board and, and a couple new uh, rook pieces like it, it handicaps you very well. That's the whole concept behind really bad chess is that it handicaps you always. If you're a really, really good chess player, if you can beat the AI in the game, then the AI will start to get better. It will start to get better pieces. So you have to play a more dis in a disciplined way in a more conservative fashion. You know, I, I'm still, even with that good handicap that I have, right, even though I get all these more queens, more bishops, more rooks, the more powerful pieces, I still lose to the AI, and uh, I've gotten pretty frustrated, but I like the appeal here. I, th I think it's a really, really neat concept. 
Yeah, for free. It seems to like to be uh, turning the uh, mechanics of chess on its head by uh, introducing uh, games, for example, where you play as all pawns or all knights or all rooks or a mix and match of the different kinds of units in chess. And uh, for free, that seems to be the right place for this kind of experimental gameplay uh, for a centuries old game. You know, and, and it's also interesting because there's also like a challenge mode. They have like weekly and daily challenges where you have a certain amount of moves or you only have certain pieces and it, to complete those, you know, get you special rewards like it's that, that's kind of neat. So you're not always playing like this ranked play where you're you're uh, just facing off the A.I. and seeing how um, how many games you can win against the A.I. Um, if you're a chess fan, it's really a must game. Don't let the title fool you. Really bad chess. You should check it out. Let's <laughs> see for yourself. OK, let's wrap this episode up. Ryan, you ready for the bonus stage? Yeah, let's do it. Giants receiver Odell Beckham Jr. wore custom Kirby-themed Nike cleats during his Week 5 game against the Baltimore Ravens. The shoes show off stars, Kirby himself, and the wispy woods trees. Some are saying he chose Kirby because of his color, so as to coincide with the NFL's annual Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October. What do you think the subliminal message is here? Do you think he absorbed his rival's powers like Kirby does, or do you think he sucks like Kirby does? No, (laughs) he's a stud. No way. (laughs) A modder by the name of Ty Anderson is recreating the Game Boy Classic The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening in the Ocarina of Time's engine. Anderson plans to release the mod as a patch to be applied to a ROM of the N64 title instead of a standalone game, which should make it a little bit harder for Nintendo to take down. I have to tell you, Taylor, this is a cool-looking concept. Yeah, it is. I saw the footage of it. But yeah, it's going to get taken down by Nintendo. It's just a matter of time at this point. Too bad, though, because it looks awesome. CBS ordered a TV game show adaptation of the hit mobile game Candy Crush Saga from Lionsgate TV. This hour-long series will feature teams of two players competing against giant interactive game boards to defeat obstacles and move through various levels. The show will also apparently offer a play-along option for viewers at home. So what now, a TV show based on Clash of Clans? <laughs> if this is the direction we're going for like the Nick Arcade-style game shows... Like, there are so many better candidates out there. Come on, man. Yeah, like really bad chess. That's it. Remember to listen and subscribe to our show, the 1P versus 2P podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn, and Clamor. You can also bookmark our site, 1PVS2P.com, where you can read our gaming blog there, too. Our sources for this week's stories have been posted at the link in the show notes. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Twitter. We're very active there at 1PVS2P underscore podcast. As always, thanks to Phonetic Hero for letting us play his music for our show, Coffee Stomp and Super Manly Brothers X. Both of those songs are part of the compilation project, Chip Tunes Equals Win. I'm Taylor Ray. That's my co-host, Ryan Ray. Thanks for listening. See you next week. Switch!